Hi everyone, I'm Jared Spataro from Microsoft. I'm here together with Nick Bloom, Professor of Economics at Stanford. In both of our positions in those two respective organizations, we do a lot of work looking at research and trends on the future of work. We're excited to be here with you today. Over the last 18 months, as we all know, uh, we have seen surface some of the biggest and perhaps over time, most durable micro and macroeconomic trends. And we just hope we can spend some time. We've talked about those earlier and just kind of decode what we're seeing and talk a little bit about the future. I think I'll kick things off, Nick, if that's okay with you, sharing some stats from what we call our Work Trends Index. We went out and surveyed uh, over 30,000 people in 31 countries, and we're just asking them about how they think work is changing and what they'd like to see stick around. We were surprised to see that over 71% of people said that they hoped that the flexibility during the pandemic would stick with them. At the same time, that same research base told us, 66% uh, of them said that they also wanted more in-person time with their colleagues. So we kind of see a little bit of tension there in those numbers. The number that kind of blew me away, Nick, before we turn over to some of yours is at, this, at the same time that we asked them those questions, 41% of people said that they expected to change jobs or change employers within the next 12 months. So people are not only rethinking kind of like how and when they work, but they're also thinking quite a bit about why they work and for whom they work. I think you've seen some of those same types of numbers as you've looked at the data too. Yes, I mean, you know, I, very aligned. So the, uh, the stylized fact we're seeing, so I just, just backdrop, we've been kind of surveying, what, 5,000 Americans a month and about 10,000 people across Europe. And we see very clearly that hybrid is the future. So the vast majority of firms who talked to individuals said, you know, they, they are going, those that are currently working from home full time are going to be hybrid post pandemic. So the typical plans we're hearing are three, two or two, three. So, you know, two, three days in the office, the other two, three days at home. Um, you know, early on, if you cast your mind back to, you know, May 2020, that was, you know, a pretty revolutionary idea. Now, I think what is unusual is any firms trying to get folks back to the office full time. And that is something I just don't hear anymore. And in fact, on your stat on looking to move on, when you survey people and ask them, if your employer told you you had to come back to the office full time, so five days a week, next month, what would you do? We see that almost 9% of people say they would quit, look for another job, about 50% say they'd come back and the other 40% said they come back, but they'd probably start actively looking around. So it looks very much like hybrid is here to stay. The big issue for me, and I'm, you know, I'll pass back to you, but happy to discuss is how to manage it because the kind of battleground on hybrid is choice. So how much do you let employees choose which days of the week and how much do you let employees choose how many days of the week? And that's where things are kind of, uh, you know, evolving rapidly in the corporate world. Yeah, I think everybody's trying different things. We certainly have seen those companies out there who have tried to mandate, you know, that that you go back on certain days. Uh, a lot of companies I feel like are settling into that three days in the office type of time frame. But Nick, what have you seen in terms of the different approaches? Are most companies mandating the days you come in or is it a bit of a free for all where you get to choose the three days if that's what the schedule is? Yeah, I would say three, two is the most common. So three days in the office, two at home. <laughs> With the proviso that, you know, we don't know where this is going. You know, it's a brave new world. So most companies are saying, look, we're going to try three, two, reassess probably next summer. And then in terms of choice, typically, you know, we've surveyed around a thousand companies a month in the U.S. And most large companies, so 250 plus employers, say they are letting things be decided at the team level or the company level. So a classic plan might be, say, what Lazards are doing. So Lazards, the investment bank, is saying, you're going to come in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whole firm, Monday, Friday, from the chief exec down, you're going to work from home. Or as you know, some other techs and banks are saying, each team gets to decide. The thing I don't see very much of, certainly by now, by the end of 2021, is what I'd call kind of a free for all, whereby firms just tell employees they can choose which days. And the reason is, it's very hard to work if, you know, I'm in a team of 10 people. If at least one of them is at home, when you're in the office, it's very hard to have a proper meeting because you've got one or two people trying to connect in on video calls. So it makes a lot of sense for teams to come in on the same days and work from home on the same days. And whether that's at the team level or the company level, that's been the dominant approach that large corporates have taken. Yeah, that's really backed up, Nick, by some of the research we've seen out of uh, our Microsoft research group is really interesting to me. During the pandemic, we found that essentially what happened to the collaboration networks is they 
They got narrower, if you will. The people got really close to the people that they worked with every day. But we saw what is often referred to as the weak ties between work groups really just sever. They just weren't there any longer. We can see that drop off in the data. And so there is this desire to kind of combine the, the combination of being in person and being at home at the right way, you know, in the right pattern. I think we're all learning. We're not sure how that's going to work, but it is pretty clear that if we want to sew those patterns, those networks back together, we're going to have to find our way towards it. That's really interesting. Now, there's, of course, you know, there's benefits for individuals. We talked about this flexibility, how, when, and where you work. It feels like there could be some benefits, though, for companies. It's not all downside for companies as they move to this flexibility. Anything that you're seeing either in the trends or the research that gives a sense that companies could benefit as they move towards more flexibility. Yeah, I mean, I think it's actually a, a pretty clear data on a win-win. So in terms of individuals, as you mentioned, they like working from home because they save on the commute and they're more productive on the days they're at home when they're focused on quiet activities. From companies' perspective, what they say is, look, we're going to structure a hybrid by being smarter about what we do. So think of pre-pandemic. In a typical week, you maybe spent half your time in meetings, very social events, you know, leaving those trainings, et cetera, maybe half the time reading, writing, or on one-on-one -on -one meetings. The plan is under hybrid, those bigger, more social events are gonna happen in the office on the three days a week you're in, say, and the quarter time's gonna happen at home. And I, I, there's a quite a large growing research base showing productivity is actually higher. If you do that for two reasons, one is people are, more productive reading, writing when they're in the quiet environment at home. And two is they save on the commute. And to put facts in this, the average American or Northern European commutes about an hour a day. And we see in the data that if you save that commute, roughly half of it you spend on your primary job and roughly half of it on leisure. So as an employer, if you save your employees, say two hours a week of commute, they're gonna work about an hour a week extra for you and take about an hour a week extra of leisure. So. That's why hybrid has become so dominant because both employees really like it and it seems to be improving productivity for employees. I love it. I love it. One other thing I'll say before we switch topics is I, I definitely am seeing companies because they're getting more comfortable with this, this hybrid or remote setup, realizing that they can tap into new labor markets, new talent markets as well. Certainly at Microsoft, we're seeing that happen. And that allows us to kind of use some of the habits, the norms, the cultural changes that we have to kind of go get after talent that, you know, previously it would have been difficult to bring to one of our hubs. So I think that there's a real advantage. I think that will have some pretty Pretty massive economic consequences over time. We'll see how it plays out. Joe, Joe I was going to make yeah, that's a great. That's a great point. One issue that comes up, you know, there's also worth thinking about is in typical large companies, around half of people can't work from home. Now, you know, frontline employees, folks in, you know, janitorial cleaning, uh, people out in retail stores, manufacturing, etc. Uh, roughly the other half can, and we've been focusing a lot on them. These are the folks that are hybrid. There's a small third segment, which you're, you know, in many ways talking about, which can actually work fully remote. So if you think of a lot of, for example, back office finance, some tech support, um, some HR, these are functions that, you know, I think, for example, at Stanford, some of these we may think about can be fully remote going forwards. It's worth thinking one of the managerial issues is how do I manage my company where I have these three tracks? People are on site all the time, people that are hybrid, and then a small group that are fully remote. As you say, the upside of the third group is you can get, tap into a much more diverse labor pool, but it does generate some management issues about, you know, equity and, you know, basic, basically remote and in-person perks across different groups. Yeah, new skills. I think new skills, new culture will be necessary. That kind of leads me to where I wanted to go, Nick. I know both of us have, have been talking and thinking quite a bit about the impact on cities, you know, getting out of just the individual and the firm, but thinking even bigger. All right, so we've got these new patterns. They might be new commute patterns. Uh, there'll be new into the office patterns. What about cities, city density, you know, as we think about uh, traffic, as we think about even, you know, economic activity in cities. What's your take on that? I think what you had to say the other day was pretty interesting. Yeah, I, again, we've been, you know, Jared and I have been talking about this for a while. So um, on the one hand, what we do know is people, residential uh, individuals have moved out of city centers. So for example, in the US, uh, I've been using very detailed data from the US Postal Service on change of address. And we can see that around 15% of Americans have left the center of large cities like New York, San Francisco, and moved out to the suburbs. So this is called the donut effect. So, you know, it's very easy to explain why. 
if I'm going to be a hybrid, I only want to come in the office two, three days a week. So I'm not that bothered about the commute, but I do want space at work. What's interesting is what corporates are going to do. And here there are two models and I kind of favor the second, but why don't I explain? So the first is what I might think is kind of the WeWork or the hub and spoke model whereby companies say, look, a lot of our employees are out in the suburbs. So why don't we have lots of little offices ringing you know, the suburbs or a few scattered around the city to make it easy to get to. The alternative view is, look, you know, if we're going to do a hybrid on the three days a week people are in, we want them to be really social, really connected. Those are critical days. And so we're going to have one big headquarters or one per city right in the center and everyone's going to come into that. So I kind of hear more support for the latter. So I can see a world whereby people move out to the suburbs, but corporates become to particularly dominate city centers. And you have folks coming in for three, say, or two days a week of concentrated interaction and then, you know, working at home the other two. Yeah, our data seems to indicate that same thing. The, one of the stats that just blew me away was this moving stat, you know, of how many people, we talked a little bit about moving their employers, 41%, but we asked another question about just geographic moves, 47%. So fully almost half of the people said that they planned a geographic move. So from one house to another within the next 12 months. And that kind of gets at what you're talking about. When there's more flexibility, I think people do think about, all right, where, where can I be and what can I tolerate if I have less of a commute to do. Now, this collides, Nick, with something else that we were talking about the other day that I'm just fascinated on. Here, we're going to look into our crystal ball a little bit. But as we start to see this collide with the, the kind of um, slowdown in globalization and the increasing fragmentation that we see macroeconomically, that's pretty interesting to me because you suggested that there might be a switch. In some ways, there could be some onshoring of certain work, offshoring of other work. You know, why don't you share with everybody your thoughts there? Because I thought it was really some pretty good prognostication as we think about really big durable trends that we could see um, kind of accelerated by the pandemic. Yeah, thanks. I mean, for, you know, for, we were talking earlier and I think both our views are we see manufacturing deglobalizing. So from talking to execs, say at Stanford and a lot of the firms I've discussed, there's the combination of obviously COVID and some of the political moves that meant firms are more nervous about having very extended supply chains. On the other hand, COVID is likely to generate a huge increase in service sector globalization. So a number of firms I've spoken to, you know, execs have said things like, you know, I've been thinking the last 18 months, you know, this team has been really great, but they've been fully remote. I haven't seen them in person for you know, a year and a half. And given that, why do they need to physically be in our office? In fact, why do they need to be in our country? Why do they maybe even need to be in our, in, in our, in our company? So I think we're going to see from 2021 onwards a big surge in companies moving some activity abroad and moving some activity out of the company. So kind of, you know, while manufacturing globalization seems to be slowing down, I think service sector globalization is going to see an explosion going forward. And for companies, it's a massive opportunity actually to, you know, distribute our activity you thought used to need to be in your head office, but now we've discovered from COVID, it probably doesn't. You know, I love talking to an economist because at the end, end of the day, I think so much of what happens, at least in these big trends, ends up being pretty economically motivated. As I kind of take a step back and think about this, I really think that the pandemic, building on some of those ideas, that the pandemic could end up just being this incredible accelerator, catalyst, you know, pressure cooker, for a bunch of macroeconomic and in some cases microeconomic things that were already happening. As we look back, I wonder if we'll see this 18 month, 24 month period as a real inflection point, you know, for some of these things. Globalization was already starting to see, you know, a change in trends like you talk about, the, the global supply chain people were worried about, and yet there you go, you have a catalyst that, that really shines a light on it. And I think we'll start to, to look back in five and 10 years and say, yep, that was the time. That's when those factors came together. Maybe one last thing, Nick, I'll, I'll talk about that uh, we talked about and then we'll close up. Um, I am really interested in how these things play out over time and how they create more opportunity, even equality types of opportunity all around the world. Some of our data indicated, for instance, that women and members of, of the Gen Z generation are most likely to apply for remote jobs. Uh, we also see some data that indicates that people are starting to work not just, you know, kind of that full time shift, but they're starting to try and find work that works around their lives. And so, like you said earlier, I think there really could be a win win here for employers and employees and, and even net net for the, the global economic environment. If we play this right, it won't happen on its own, but I, I see a bright future if we work together. Any last thoughts for our viewers today as we finish up? 
No, I, I totally agree. I mean, f f you know, for people running their firms, one is to expect continuous change, but two, as you said, you know, use it to exploit it for opportunities. I mean, another group is older workers, workers that might previously have retired and now will be happy to work remote two, three days a week. And, you know, people with young kids that wouldn't come in, people in different parts of the country. So you're totally spot on. I think this is a huge period of change, which needs continuous vigilance to make sure you exploit it, but it's going to present a lot of opportunities for business. That's great. Nick, always good to talk with you. Thanks for spending the time here. Thanks very much, Chad.